which is where is the coming of Jesus? No, no light uh, subject, I'm afraid. Um, really to just represent, I'll explain the picture. I think it's helpful actually, is just to say, um, and we'll come on to the verse that says that people are looking up to the sky, wondering where is this Jesus coming? When is he gonna return? And the verses we're looking at today, 2 Peter 3, 1 to 9, uh, is a fascinating dive into those that believe that Jesus isn't coming back. This perception that because the world has been going and going around, if he hasn't done anything yet, which is a falsehood, but he hasn't done anything yet, what, what chance, what evidence do I have that he's going to come at the end, this second coming of Jesus? Well, last week we explored the case made by Peter about false teachers uh, that mislead and deceive believers uh, and that their only intention is for self-acclaim, self-promotion, self-worship uh, and self-gain. Uh, we packed a lot in last week and I thank you for your patience. It was a longer one than usual but it was a lot and I, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I actually want to concentrate on this part more which is over two weeks it's the day of the Lord, as you see in the, in the Bible, it's titled the day of the Lord. And it, it's just this amazing picture of Jesus coming back. Um, so we're going to slow it down a bit and take the 2 Peter 3 into two chunks. Um, two, in this particular part of, of Peter, uh, 2 Peter, he's focusing on two main principles uh, that false teachers operate by. So there was a general understanding that Peter was trying to tell us. He said, they're greedy, there's a general principle about them, they're out for themselves. And now he says, uh, there's two things in particular that you need to be careful of. Uh, one is that, they say, Christ would not return. Uh, and therefore, the second was that there would be no judgment. So you see what they're carefully doing is they're saying, if there's no second coming of Jesus, that means you can do what you like. Do you see how clever they're trying to dress this up? You can do whatever you want, because Jesus isn't coming back, do whatever sin you like because Jesus is not returning. So they, they carefully thought through, or so we think, or so people might think, carefully thought through this deception, and then we'll see what Peter says about it. But based on that truth, on the truth that Jesus is returning and judgment will come for all people, he also then proceeds to tell believers on how to live well in respect to honouring Christ. How do we live before he comes back in honouring him uh, during that time before his return. So this week, we're going to look at the specific false claims made by these false teachers and then how Peter debunks, as it were, their false teaching with more evidence. Uh, but evidence is good, but more importantly, uh, that God will not be moved by anyone to do anything uh, unless it is by his decision and choice to do so. Uh, and Christians would call this the sovereignty of God, that no matter how much you might provoke God or plead with God, God will do whatever is in his will and knows is the right thing to do at the right time. And so Christians have should have this view that we believe and accept the sovereignty of God, that he will decide what is best for us and what to do next. So what I think we can learn from this today is that in God not responding to those baiting him, uh, as it were, through scoffing, as we'll see in the text, what it actually reveals about God is evidence that God is truly patient and merciful, uh, wanting as many people to come to him in repentance and place their trust in Jesus before he returns. In essence, we truly will truly understand that every day is a blessing. And I know we say that uh, among the Christian community, we say every day is a blessing. Uh, but looking at this text, you will truly understand that every day is indeed a blessing when you read this text. Uh, and, and those words will no longer be a kind of throwaway thing that Christians say all the time. But it is especially a blessing for those who still have not put their trust in Jesus. God is being incredibly patient with those who have not put their trust in him. But that will not continue forever, and Peter comes to this as well. And Christ will indeed return one day, and that day will come unexpectedly. So let's look at our first set of verses. This is 2 Peter 1, 3, 1 to 4. Sorry, 2 Peter 3, 1 to 4. Dear friends, this is now uh, my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to, st 
stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets, that's the Old Testament, and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through the apostles, that's the New Testament as we understand it today. Uh, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. So this statement is being made by the false teachers, okay, just to be clear. This has been made by people who don't really believe in Jesus, and what they're trying to do is deceive believers. And so Peter makes this point. But as we look at these verses, Peter starts with this theme that he's been running with throughout this letter as we've been going through it, to remind Christians of what they already know and so act on it. Uh, in the Greek, uh, as we see in the, uh, the first part, it's we've got wholesome thinking, I think is in the NIV, ESV, I think is sincere minds is the term. Uh, it means something to be found pure um, when examined by sunlight. And there is a, a helpful analogy that's used to, with this, but as usual, I need to give you the uh, kind of caveat not all analogies are very good. Actually, no analogies are very good in ultimately describing certain aspects of the Bible because they're worldly things and, and you know, ultimately they fall apart. But one that might be helpful is this legend that states that uh, a pottery salesman would use wax to disguise cracks in their pottery. Uh, and they would use wax to put it back together. They'd use wax to keep it held together uh, but when someone held it up to the light, the light would penetrate through the wax. And so they would see the cracks in the pottery that they were trying to, they were conning them. Uh, and so they, they would ultimately see that it's a, not so much a fake, but a put together. They've done something, you know, that's broken. Actually, I just want to sell it. I need to get rid of it and make a bit more money out of this. And so they would see they were being conned. But a pure whole piece of pottery would obviously pass this test and so it would be found to be flawless so again when you hold a piece of uh, hello guys you're right when you hold a you hold a, a piece of pottery fully made not cracked not um uh, put back together as it were when you held up to the light you would see no cracks you would see nothing through it it would be a pure complete piece of pottery what Peter begins with is a statement to prepare our minds and focus our thinking and being self-controlled in doing so. Trusting in what has already happened and were spoken previously to these events. So you saw in the text, he said, he refers to the prophets, which is the Old Testament, and he refers to the New Testament by saying the, the apostles that came and then also shared the word about Jesus. And so he's, he's covering that off again uh, just to reassure you, it is evidence to show that Jesus is who he says he is. He is. And he says this because what's going to happen uh, in the last days is that many people will come with worthless ideas. They'll spout loads of empty thinking about the Bible and about who God is and who Jesus is and all silly nonsense. And so he says, prepare, because it might even sound convincing but it is not true. Now, when we talk about the last days, I'll give you some background. Uh, the Bible talks about the last days. Jesus talks about it. The Bible generally talks about it in the New Testament as well. But when en anyone ever mentions the last days, what it means is today. So these are the last days uh, before Jesus returns. And so the title you'll find in the Bible for this section will be the day of the Lord. Uh, and so... The last days are between Christ's ascension, which is when he, after he wrote, he'd risen again, went back to God, the last days begin, in effect. And then the last days finish is when Jesus comes back in the second coming. And so that is the day of the Lord. And it will be indeed the last day. When Jesus comes back, it will be the last day. And it will be the last day, certainly in context of how this, the heaven and the world and the earth operates. Uh, and I'll get to this verse in Revelation. 
what will happen is Jesus will make everything new. It will be wiped away and Jesus will start again in a way uh, of a new heaven and a new earth. And now in itself, this day of the Lord might happen in one day or it might happen in a number of days, but it's likely that we'll see a number of days because we read this and I'll read it in Revelation. And so we tend to look at the book of Revelation and understand it to be the beginning of Christ's return to earth and he is coming to judge the world and bring full salvation to those who believe. So Revelation 19, 11 to 19 says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and his head are many crowns. He has, uh, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of King, Lord of Lord. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of the kings, generals, mighty men, not literal, by the way, uh, of their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. It's imagery, please remember. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. This very event is what the false teachers are denying will happen. They're saying, if it hasn't happened in my lifetime, it won't happen at all. And why are they saying that? It is because we are so linear as human beings, and to, to much of a degree, we are so self-centered that we think everything should happen when we are on earth, then when we are here. And so we go, well, if it isn't happening when I'm here, I mean, it's me, by the way, look at me, why aren't you doing anything now, God? Then it won't happen at all. But for them, for those false teachers, it seems that everything is going on since the beginning of creation. And by that logic, they claim, it will continue. And now let me be clear, this is not simply someone saying it hasn't happened yet, so therefore it won't. It's, it's not naivety. It's not a simple naivety as if they could blame it on not knowing something. This denial comes from an evil desire, as we'll see in Peter, to deny it to the point so as to validate continuing to act in sinful desires. Let me put it this way. If I can deny the concept, the idea even, that Jesus is not coming back and that coming back is from to judge the world, here's my logic flow. If Jesus doesn't come back, that means he won't judge sin, therefore I can get on with whatever I want. I can do whatever I like, I can do whatever I want, and nothing will happen to me because Jesus isn't coming back. And that's what they are saying. They're saying the world will just continue to turn as it is. And you can do whatever you want. And this whole Christ returning and the whole judgment thing will not happen anyway. I don't know if you've heard this saying. I heard it a lot when I was a kid. You wait ages for a bus and two come along at once. I, th I think it doesn't stop being said for generation to generation to generation. But, but there is one thing about that statement. Unless all buses have been cancelled, of course, and again, that's why analogies fall apart. But you can be sure that as day is day and night is night, that that bus will come. Uh, when I was younger... When my parents took me out somewhere, we used to go over to East London, see my grandparents, love that trip, same trip every time, but I absolutely loved it. Most of the time we'd always get a bus, it's cheaper, couldn't really afford to get a train unless that was a special treat as well, uh, but we'd get a bus. Uh, and now when, uh, when the, we was at a bus stop that had like an obscure view of where the bus was coming from, uh, I would position myself 
away from the bus stop where I could see the bus coming. And my mum and dad hated it. They hated me running all the way down the road and saying, no, I'm going to, I felt I'm a very practical person and I wanted to do something. I felt like I've got to do, I don't just wait here. I'll tell them when the bus is coming. And so I'd run down to the corner road and just stand there and watch to see if this bus was coming. And when the bus appeared, I would sprint back. And I was quite fast back then. I'm nowhere near as fast now as I was then. Um, I only, by the way, I only came second in races in the playground when I was younger to another kid who was super fast. Uh, and then other kids came and then fourth, fifth, sixth, you know, start falling back. But I would sprint back to the bus stop and try and get there before the bus got there. But all that to say is, this really is an analogy of what the scoffers, the false teachers are doing. For them, they stand at this kind of proverbial bus stop. Uh, and, and just because one doesn't turn up when they're there, they conclude that one will not turn up at all. As Christians, we know that not only will Jesus return, but when he returns, he will judge the world. By then, for those who are still looking to the sky for Jesus' return, or from the bus stop, as it were, they would have already missed it. For those who believe in Christ, we have no need to look around the corner. We have no need to go and wait for the bus somewhere else or to look out for it anymore. We have no need to look for Christ in the sky and see his return. Instead, the Bible calls us to trust in what God has already promised and say, I trust what God says I don't need to look out for him. He will come regardless. What we're doing is that we'll trust what God has promised before, and so he will deliver again. Acts 1, verse 6 to 11 says, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, and this is a disciple who's asking this. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all in Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. In other words, you will not miss it. You will not miss the time that Jesus is coming back. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The only way that can happen is if everyone sees it at the same time. He is coming back. Just as Peter prepares us to focus and remember on what God has done before and trust in the word, so now we've no need to look for this sign. This sign or that sign, this thing or that thing. Because just as sure he went up to heaven, so he will return. Matthew 24, verses 6 to 13 you will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are beginning the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. I know that's very difficult to hear. Uh, when I, whenever I, I preach a sermon, whenever I'm telling anyone about Christianity, uh, yes, we don't do... Uh, revelation preaching in that sense it's not a fear that you come to God with it's not let me believe in God because I'm worried about death but on the same side to give balance this is true 
We need to come to Jesus and we want many more to come to Jesus. God himself wants many more to believe in him before this time comes. But it will mean in those times that Christians will be persecuted. The reason why we know that will happen is because it already happens. It already happens in other countries around the world. If you want proof, you can look up China, you can look up all sorts of other places where Christians are persecuted. I I even know of other people who have family members who have gone to preach the gospel, who have gone set up churches or home churches in other countries, and they have to be particularly careful. Sometimes those people don't necessarily are persecuted or put to death or in any way, actually. But they are watched and they're careful about what they say. But ultimately, true Christians of the gospel will have to speak the truth and that will get them in trouble. And so we will see that across the world. There are many, many countries, by the way, that this happens in many countries uh, where Christians are. Uh, you can look at, by the way, just to give you a resource, Open Doors. Uh, you look that up and you can find out what the most persecuted countries for Christians are. Uh, and you'll see, oh, year on year, it's getting worse of Christians being imprisoned, put to death and all those terrible things. But they do amazing work, by the way, uh, to try and help them and support them uh, in their work. So it is sometimes hard to hear and understand. And... and and it is a sad revelation that many Christians, as the Bible says, will turn away from the faith before Jesus finally returns. But even as hard as that is to hear, it is true. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 to 4. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. So this is Paul speaking to Timothy, who is training up, and he sends him these letters, helping him and encouraging him in how to be, preach the word and and go out on God's mission to share the gospel. Uh, out of season, correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Uh, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. This, I'm afraid, is the reality. As we encourage and celebrate more people coming to Christ, that's fantastic, and we should keep doing that, and they become, become Christians, we must be sure that they're not simply a number, uh, but a free person in Christ. This person must be grounded in the word and trusting in its power and promises. Because what will come is if we don't put ourselves into the word, it's not even listening to me, by the way, or any preacher or any teacher. Uh, there is only so much I can share with you. Every Christian must get into the Bible. They must read and protect themselves from what is to come. And is actually acting out today towards Christians. The temptation draw us away from those things, from the, from the word of God. But to this end, Peter then also talks about these great deceivers who will also turn many away from the faith, encouraging wickedness and hate, as well as the falsehood that sin is okay. And so he continues, 2 Peter 3, 5 to 7. But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed. So this is Peter's argument, put it in context. Peter's now putting an argument back on the false teachers, saying, what you're saying is nonsense. <laughs> Here's the proof, he says. Long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged in, and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. You see, what the false teachers have assumed by their statement that the world just carries on as it has from the beginning is that God doesn't intervene. As if he just set the universe off and let it go on its way. By the way, there was a terrible BBC programme uh, series show many years ago. Christopher Eccleston was playing a quasi-Jesus character uh, and what their claim was, was that 
once he, he was trying to get off of Earth to join back with God, supposedly. And once he'd done that, they then left the universe to itself and disappeared. I mean, talk about, I mean, it's all, I, I can understand people twisting the Bible, but to make up some other thing entirely was just ridiculous. And you watch it and you think, what did I just watch? Why did I just waste my time watching this utter garbage? But you see, when they have this view, it means you end with the conclusion, well, that being the case, we should just live how we want because Jesus is not coming back and there's no judgment. But as Peter points out, there's a flaw in your thinking. What they do is deliberately, he says, leave out details, in effect, is what he's saying. And worse still, they deliberately forget intentionally disregarding what the Bible has said. And this is why, again, why Peter does refer back to the beginning. God created the universe and set all the processes and laws in place. Now, they may still say, well, he set it up and, and let it go. The problem is, when Peter refers to the event of Noah and the flood the of the entire earth, that in itself points to a God who literally intervened in the history of the world. And I, you, can come, you can go through the Old Testament and read multiple examples of God intervening in the world, of God doing the work that he needs to do in order to bring about his plan. The exodus of the Israelites is one big example. Did the Israelites open the, the sea and walk through it? Of course they didn't. God did. God intervened in natural processes, opened up the sea, and let them walk through. In Genesis uh, 7, verse 6 to 7, this was the account of Noah. It says, Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape uh, the waters of the flood. Then I saw, ooh, ooh. Jumped ahead. Stop. I didn't see the seven. All right. But this particular example is what Peter's referring to. He's referring to the, the story of Noah. It's, it's bigger, obviously, than this, uh, these two verses. But this example is, is interesting. Moses wrote this account based on oral tradition. Uh, and that is that it was passed down to him. So... It was a thing that happened, and through the generations, it got passed down to him, and he retells it as well. But it turns out there are over 200 historical flood accounts from across the world of this very event. Uh, one good resource, uh, which has suddenly gone out of my head, Cold Case Christianity. Really good website, tells you a lot of stuff about evidence and all that sort of good thing as well. I'd advise you to go and look at that. But there were 200 accounts of this same flood. And on average, the, de the details found in Moses' description in the Bible and in those other accounts have an average match, and that's the, the different events that went on during that time, of 73%. These are different people, don't know each other, and yet... A rough match of 73%, and, and that's, that obviously goes up and down depending on what part of the account that they're telling. It says that the, the details that match up is the favoured family, Noah's family, uh, an advance warning, which is also in the Bible, a global flood, obviously, uh, of what we're talking about. The use of a boat by survivors is what other accounts tell us, uh, to save animals and then landing on a mountain. These are other accounts outside of the Bible that tell us the same thing. But why is Moses' uh, Moses's account, as it were, more trustworthy than other accounts? Remember, Moses was the one who went up to Mount Sinai and spoke to God and wrote about that experience. He himself has had, I would say direct, but if he had direct contact with God, he'd, he'd be dead, because we read that in the text as well. But he had the most direct uh, contact with God. But in comparison to the other accounts, the Bible shows a genealogy of Noah, of where he came from, where, certainly where his sons then went to after the flood. All those other accounts 
do not show any connection after that flood event. And that alone provides a connection from before the flood to after the flood. Others, as I say, seems to stop at the flood. And so in secular history, and even archaeological discoveries, it appears that the, the, the Japhethites, coming from the son of um, Japhat, son of Noah, Japhat, are likely ancestors of Indo-Europeans. That's important, hold that in your mind. Then there's Shem, who is the third son, who had five sons, and he inhabited Euphrates and reached the Indian Ocean. You see how they connected together. So, but the, the Bible is the only one that then speaks of the genealogy of Noah after the event. Can you trust it? I, I think you can. I believe you can. The only one that actually shows a consistent record, most certainly. But this is very basic evidence, and obviously I don't have time to go into all the other evidences that you'll find in the Bible, but all that to say is that the biblical account is reliable because not only is the detail tame, and this is really important, by the way, the details aren't extravagant. The details are very tame, very specific, very focused, and it's reasonable. So historians agree that it's reasonable in its writing. It also provides a link to Noah before and after the flood, found in history and in archaeological records. Again, we can go through this all day, but back to the point that Peter is driving toward. God has and does intervene in the events of the world with the intention of using them towards his final promise being fulfilled in Jesus' second coming. To achieve this, Peter says that by the same word God brought the heavens and the earth into being, that he basically created them, the same word that brought a flood over the earth, the same word will bring fire and destruction and bring judgment on all mankind. But I need to assure you it is not for nothing. This sounds incredibly hard to some degree to hear that everything here will be burned up, everything will be burned up, but we tend to find that in fire things are purified. And this is what the fire is for. It will bring about a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So that's in fire and that's gone. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. But to when, as to when this will happen is not, for us to worry about because Peter says this 2 Peter 3 8 to 9 but do not forget this one thing dear friends with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness he's patient with you not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance let me begin by saying that sometimes that previous verse about one day in a thousand years is used incorrectly to talk about whether how old the earth is. That's not what Peter is talking about. Okay, let's just be clear. That can't be used as an argument. Say how old the earth is. Where you think it's seven days, a thousand, seven thousand years, seven billion years, whatever. That's not what this is about. Peter says that God is not bound by time from a human perspective. And this is important because if we accept we have an all-knowing God, knowing everything from beginning to end, then it would follow that time does not have hold over God either. Uh, a couple of verses here, Isaiah 46, 10, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, I will do all that I please. Uh, Isaiah 42, verse 9, see the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. If there is a God that knows every action taken, every thought you have for your whole life, 
wouldn't the logical conclusion be that God does not need to rush or slow down? That if God is outside of time and can see the whole of time, there's no such thing as slowing or speeding up. God is present all the time. In fact, everything has been done and will be done in, time, in the time God has made it right to happen. There's this old film, I'll say old because it makes me feel old, uh, called uh, Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. Um, I can't remember the year it was, it was a long time ago, but I, I enjoyed the film, it was a, a sort of funny comedy, but basically what happens in it is he goes through this same day over and over again. You see how linear we are, we make films about time. Um, and he first gets frustrated, so he, after the first day, he goes to sleep, he wakes up, and the radio comes on exactly the same as it was yesterday. He starts getting frustrated that it's happening again. I can't escape this loop, he starts getting angry, and then he moves to this realisation that he can do anything, therefore, because he knows what the day is going to turn out like. And so he does. For a while, he then does loads of silly things. He does loads of stupid things. But then that gets boring and he still gets frustrated. But then he finally sees the purpose. In the last part of the film, the main character knows that day inside out, backwards and forwards, knowing who is going to do what and when. And in fact, he manages to help loads of people when originally he claimed not to have the time. And so you'll see uh, homeless people and all sorts of people, and his life was filled with business and selfishness. But knowing how the day was going to pan out, he decides to go the other way, and all these people that asked him for help during that day, he decides to help them. Not only that, he decides to abundantly help them, and he gets involved, and he, he tries to do good things to help people. Knowing, of course, that really what he wants is to escape this loop of a day and get on with his life. But he knows exactly how to pan out. It wasn't that he didn't have time, but how to apply his time due to now known events of the day that he didn't previously know. One of the main things you will see his character do as he realises the purpose of this looping day is that he becomes calmer and more peaceable, even very likeable. And the reason for that example is I want, I want to hopefully help you understand a tiny bit because that film is not going to explain what God is like but a tiny bit that if this one person knows that day inside out because he's lived it over and over again he knows what's going to happen next he even knew what someone was going to say to him next even got into the point where he answered the questions before they asked him you can start to understand that if God is similar to this but even more so knows every single day inside out God is peaceable. God doesn't rush. God doesn't panic. God is not scared. He's not worried about who will do what. He is at peace. And so in a similar way, God certainly knows all things that we will do and what will happen every day. And hence we have this amazing God of peace. And really this is what I need to get over for us today. When we read these verses in Peter, Peter is trying to give us a sense of calmness, a sense of peace, and a sense of trust in God. He's saying, you don't need to worry. Don't worry, don't even think for a second that these false teachers have God worried. As if God's panicking about the plan again. Oh no, these false teachers are causing me a headache. Nah. He's saying, you don't need to worry about that. No one can budge God from what he will do. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. God's purpose, therefore, is not simply about timing. But in knowing that timing, he is able to be driven by this loving patience towards his creation. God's purpose in not doing something now because we want him to, would be at the detriment to all of us. Let me be clear about this. We want peace on the entire earth, 
and that's a good and noble thing to pray for and ask for. But the peace that we're asking for, as in the peace for the whole world, will only come when Jesus returns. And, and there is one thing to be really thoughtful about, really consider carefully. There will be people who will be left behind and will go to hell because they have not trusted in Jesus. And that is should be sad for us. We don't lord it over people because they don't believe. We don't come with them because we think, well, we know better than you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that it makes us feel sad that people don't come and believe in Jesus. And so we don't need to beg God for it to happen more quickly because it's in God's hands. And actually, you know what? I would love to have my family saved, not, not my immediate family as, as such, because there's all sorts of different things. You know, children grow up and they start getting different ideas. Of course they do. But my, my, my further family, my mum and dad, my, my brothers, and I want them to be saved. But I'm also aware that there'll be a time that God will stop in his grace and Jesus will come back and he will judge the world. All this to say is we've got to trust that he has got the plan sorted. He's got the plan necessary for us to be saved. And in the current time, this is what we're going to be doing, right? In the rest of our lives, until Jesus returns or until we meet him, we should be ready to share the gospel, ready for the opportunity to bring that love and understanding to those who are chained to the world, who have Get, let the world become their idol, have let the world become their God. Come with love and peace that Jesus Christ came with, so that they know the truth, that they are being deceived. God wants all people to come and know him, not forced, by the way. This is what grace, in a very simple term, means. Grace means God does not want you forced to know, to know him and believe in him. He wants you to believe in him of your own volition, your own choice. That is a truly loving God. Or he could have made us do that. He has all the power to do so. Yet he's given us this amazing ability to choose. Because it's not about a relationship of box checking and law keeping. It is about a loving relationship between you and your Lord and Saviour. God wants all to be saved by the grace of God, which allows us to choose him over the world. And I'm going to leave you with these verses. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And this is as simple as it gets, folks. This is as simple as it is. Time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. I've just given you a whatever minute sermon that was, and that is the fundamental culmination of what it is. Repent and believe in the good news, but Jesus wants you to be saved and to come to him and know him as your true saviour. I'm going to pray and then we'll worship together.